If you would please rise for our praise music. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all here this this morning on a beautiful a beautiful morning and uh, nice temperatures. A little cooler temperatures last night. Uh, 
fact, I was out on the deck this morning and my wife came out, oh, geez, it's freezing. <laughs> you know, it just, hey, six, the upper 60s feel cool after 80s, don't they? So, um, but very happy to see you all today. Don't forget that today, uh, after, right after the service is our ice cream social and we're celebrating also birthdays in July. So please stick around if you know what's good for you. We have a, a lot of different kinds of ice cream to choose from and you can make whatever you'd like. And also we do have a birthday. And just in case she might be listening online. So let's sing to decline. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dean. Happy birthday to you. And also, uh, let's say hello to our folks at home. If you want to turn around and Give a wave. Morning. It's kind of nice. We're normally doing that to Steve, and now here he is in the back today. So <laughs> we're doing it for real there. <laughs> Our call to worship is taken this week from Psalm 108, verses 1 through 5. My heart, O God, is steadfast. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre, I will awaken in the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. And our response, for great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Praise and honor be to Almighty God forever and ever. Amen. And if you would, please remain standing and pull out your hymnals for number 436. be seated. Let us bow our heads now for our prayer of confession. Our Father, forgive our sins. Forgive the sins that we, re that we remember and the sins we have forgotten. Forgive our many failures in the face of temptation and those times when we have been stubborn in the face of correction. Forgive the times we have been proud of our own achievements and those when we have failed to boast in your works. 
forgive the harsh judgments we have made of others and the leniency we have shown to ourselves. Forgive the lies we have told to others and the truths we have avoided. Forgive us the pain we have caused others and the indulgence we have shown ourselves. Lord God, have mercy on us and make us whole. Now, if you would, please take this time for silent prayer. Amen. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. And if you would, please say with me our assurance of pardon. Hear the good news. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And I wondered, Diana Hecker, if you could grab the blanket that we would like to bless today. Uh, this blanket is for Nora's uh, niece, Betty Ann Johnson, and she's having some heart issues that uh, are very, actually quite rare, uh, and as you mostly know, rare is not good in the medical field, and so we want to uh, we want to give her this blanket that was so lovingly made for her. And uh, on the inside of the blanket, it actually has a, a different pattern of butterflies. And so these are all things that, that, she, that she likes. And uh, so we want to go ahead and, and bless this and, and, and give this to her. So let's bow our heads, please. May God's grace be upon this shawl, warming, comforting, and folding and embracing. May this mantle be a safe haven, a sacred place of security and well-being, sustaining and embracing in good times as well as difficult ones. May the one who receives this shawl be cradled in hope, kept in joy, graced with peace, and wrapped in love. Blessed be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. This is just a quick reminder that uh, for the month of July, um, our mission project for uh, the month is we are collecting um, money. We're going to donate it to inner church ministries. They have a voucher system that we're going to contribute to where if you are in need of gas or clothing or groceries or stuff like that, um, it's not like a handout. I guess I'd say it's, it's what do we say? It's like a hand up, like, it's not like, hey, I'm gonna come get whatever anytime I want to. Um, but if people are in need of something, it's a voucher, they, they can take that to a certain store or whatever and um, they can use that. So there's a box kind of in the back of the church in front of Max back there. Um, and if you would make, if you're gonna write a checkout, can you make it out to the church, right, Diane? And then we, we will just collect all that money and write out one check. So that is for the month of July. So thank you very much, thank you. Probably if you make out your check to just in the memo line right for the uh, for the mission for July and Diane will will know what to go for with, with from there so. Malachi 310 tells us bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house test me in this says the Lord Almighty and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven 
and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. While we enjoy the next piece of music, let us consider how we may offer our time, our talents, or any other good gifts that we have received from the Lord to benefit and further God's will for his creation. Your tithes and offerings may be placed in the plate at the back of the sanctuary as you are leaving today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts that you have given to us. Lord, we pray that you put your hands upon them and multiply them so that we may do your will for others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is Nate. Nate became a Christ follower two weeks ago and is still a bit giddy about it. Now he's trying not to do cartwheels in public. Nate became a believer partly because of Kim. Yet oddly enough, Kim and Nate have never met. Now is this possible? Well, let's take a look. Kim loved Jesus from an early age and in college she had a huge impact on her friends. While most of her peers used their college years to, well, experiment, Kim didn't. She remained committed to her faith, and it showed. It especially showed to Lisa, her roommate, who confessed to Kim that she wanted whatever it was that made Kim so strong. Kim shared her faith with Lisa, and Lisa believed. Years later, at Lisa's first real job, she met Thomas. 
Thomas was hit by a drunk driver when he was 13 and still carried a lot of anger and bitterness. Thomas and Lisa became friends, and it wasn't long before he started going to church with Lisa and her husband. After a lot of studying and searching, Thomas gave his life to Christ. Fast forward a few years. Thomas became a public speaker and was often asked to speak at large events. See, when he became a believer, Thomas developed a new perspective on life. He stopped resenting what had been taken from him and started being thankful for the second chance he had been given. On one particular day, Thomas shared about overcoming hardship and what it means to choose joy. He was so passionate that a number of people were inspired to share a link to his video. The video of Thomas inspired James too. And if anyone needed inspiration, it was him. James had a ton of issues. He spent most of his life as a passive husband, an absent father, and a horrible friend. That said, no one disliked him more than he disliked himself. But everything changed the night he happened to watch Thomas online. Something clicked and he knew what he had to do. He surrendered his miserable life to someone greater and he was forever changed. James fought hard to make up for the lost years with his family. He also began working with young men who were in danger of throwing their lives away. One of those men was Nate. Nate didn't really know his own dad, and he had no real direction in life, ultimately bouncing from one bad decision to another. Because of that, he often found himself in trouble with the law. No one had ever showed him what it looked like to be a real man. That is, until he met James. James became the first father figure Nate ever had. He learned about honesty, self-control, humility, and integrity, and where those traits come from. Two months later, Nate publicly declared his belief in Christ. And of course, James was there. Now you can see the connection. Nate was impacted by James, who was influenced by Thomas. Thomas saw an uncommon joy in Lisa, who learned of Jesus from Kim. Kim's relationship with God eventually led to Nate's. Funny how these two people have never met and never will. They literally never knew each other. Walked out of a door in the same building never knew each other and never knew that the one brought the other to Christ. It's amazing. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is from Jeremiah 1, 4 through 10. You can find it on page 1169 of your pew Bible. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone as I had sent to you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put words in your mouth. See today, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow to build and to plant. May God bless this reading of his holy word. Our New Testament reading today is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 8 verses 28 through 33, and can be found on page 1757 of your Pew Bible. 
And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Mark and Ellen. I want you to imagine for a moment that all of creation is a giant puzzle. No, not a puzzle that contains trivia, although our lives are very trivial sometimes, but a giant jigsaw puzzle. This puzzle is vast, so much so that people never get to see the whole thing at once. The puzzle comprises all of time, all that has ever been created, and all eternity. Like I said, it is vast. The puzzle has a theme that runs throughout the entire thing, but it is different at the same time. Its themes run from one part of history to the next, never stopping, always changing, yet in some strange way, always remaining the same. The puzzle is multi-layered, composed of periods that occupy time and space, but also other areas where time has no meaning. Confused yet? Intrigued yet? Either way, listen on. As you can already see, this is no ordinary jigsaw puzzle. It reminds me of the chessboard in the original Star Trek television series of the 60s, the one that Spock used. Not like ours that was one dimensional, but one that utilized multiple boards that were linked together that the pieces on the board could travel between. As I told you before, this jigsaw puzzle is multi-layered, similar to Spock's chessboard but far more complex, even for the Vulcan mind. This puzzle can only be seen by God. None of his other creations can see all of its parts. Not the angels, nor human beings, not even Satan himself has the power to see the whole puzzle. Yet each of us has a hand in its making. You might think that I'm going to say that we are all the pieces of the puzzle, but I think it is much more complex than that. We are sometimes the pieces, yes, sometimes the ones moving those pieces, and sometimes we are helping to create the pieces as the puzzle is being put together. Some imagine God as a puppeteer that is using us as his puppets, animating us beyond our control and finding great joy in our sufferings, hogwash. That is not our God. God is not interested in puppets, but real life people living their own real lives. If our God was as terrible as some think, we would be pieces of the puzzle only that were placed exactly 
where God puts us. And we would have no choice in it. But as I said, we are much more than pieces in this puzzle. To understand this puzzle, first you must understand the meaning of it all, and that can be summed up by one very powerful word, love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 tells us, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Know this. God does not require anything to sustain himself. He is the Almighty. But he chose to create us, his children, out of his great love for us. This should not be a hard concept, especially if you have children. Before you had children, they did not exist. Yet, you did. And you would have continued living even if they hadn't been born. But after your children were born, you couldn't imagine living life without them. Why? Because you love them so much. God is even more so this way as his love is timeless and without sin, pure love, which we cannot conceive of yet. God does not need us in the truest sense of the word, but we are an extension of his all-powerful love, maybe even a part of him, an outward result of his love. He loves us so much that he created everything for us. I don't know about you, but that is an awesome yet humbling feeling. So, if we can understand that we are a part of this grand puzzle, and that we are not just pieces, but co-authors with our creator in how each piece fits into the whole, we must also understand that although we don't get to see the top of the box to know exactly how everything will look in the end, if you can really say that eternity is an end, we should know that like any jigsaw puzzle, every piece must fit together perfectly for the whole puzzle to work. You can try to put similar pieces in the wrong spot, but it just never fits right. And it always leaves another piece out in the end. Only God knows what the top of the box looks like. And we must have faith that he knows what he's doing. In fact, that is faith. In the film, It's a Wonderful Life, Jimmy Stewart's character, George Bailey, becomes overcome by life's troubles and attempts suicide by jumping off of a bridge. He is saved by his guardian angel, Clarence. George tells Clarence that he wishes he had never been born and that the world would have probably been better off without him. Unfortunately, this is a common statement by those who contemplate suicide. And Clarence tells him he mustn't think that way. But it's also, it also gives him an idea. He looks toward heaven and he asks, that that be done. And just like that, George Bailey had never been born. When the two of them go back out into the night, George finds that everything is different. The town has a different name. A respected pharmacist is now a homeless alcoholic. George's little brother is dead. And many other things in the town are changed for the worse. George asks why everything had changed. 
And Clarence tells him, George, it is because you were never born. You weren't there to keep Mr. Potter from changing the town. You weren't there at the pharmacy to catch a fatal mistake made by the pharmacist. And you weren't there to save your little brother from drowning when he was 10 years old. Which in turn made it so he wasn't alive to become a war hero that saved many other people from dying too. All of this because George Bailey, the hometown boy that thought he never did anything important, was alive to do all those things. Of course, we know that in the end, all is made right. And George comes back to, back to his life with a renewed hope and the many gifts that a so-called normal life has to offer. You are no different. We are all an integral, a part of the grand puzzle. I've done a lot with ancestry. And I have found that it is also like putting a puzzle together. We each know pieces of our ancestry. And once you start putting them together, you find that it is all a very large portrait. I've gone back as far as the 1500s in some of my lineage. And the more I found out, the more I was amazed at how each person and every decision that they made in life influenced what came after. For example, I found that through my maternal line, I had a 10 times great grandfather who was a preacher in 17th century England that did not agree with the Church of England. After years of persecution by the crown and the church, he and 101 other passengers set sail with a crew of 30 to 40 men on a ship headed to the New World, a place where they could worship as they see fit and to raise their families in a place where they would not be corrupted by the wealth and privilege of England. These people were known as Brownists, but later became known as Puritans. And they sailed to the New World on a ship that you may know called the Mayflower. My many times great-grandfather's name was William Brewster. And he was the eldest member and designated spiritual leader of the group known as the Pilgrims. Obviously, this was fascinating to know that one of my ancestors was on the Mayflower. In fact, I found that I had more than one family I was descended from from on that ship. As do most if they can trace their lineage back to it. But I was amazed at how this small bunch of Pilgrims 150 if you count the crew, and then half of them died in the first winter, so it was even less than that. But over the next 400 years, they produced one ton of a bunch of relatives. Talk about being fruitful and multiplying. These folks had huge families, with 10 and 12 children not being uncommon. But I also found this, that had one of these people, just one of them, altered one decision in their life to move to a different place, or to not move to a different place, or to marry someone different, if one of those things changed, I don't exist. I was thinking about this one day, and I examined just my short lifetime alone. Had my maternal grandfather not moved from Penfield to Erie to work at General Electric during World War II, my mother could have still been born, but what are the chances that she would have met my father who was born in Erie? 
It's possible, but is it probable? Here's another. I told my nephew that he probably wouldn't exist had I not had one certain friend in high school. As you can guess, he had quite the quizzical look on his face. But bear with me, as he did. I was on a baseball team at 13 years old that placed me and my future friend Troy together. We were in the same grade in school and we knew each other, but we weren't really friends yet. As the years went on, though, we became more like brothers than friends, sharing many adventures and misadventures together. Troy had a brother, Eric, who was six years older than us. And later in life, he was in the Air Force, stationed at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. When Eric retired from the service, he helped run a company near Dayton as an electrical engineer. The night before my friend Troy was getting married, we were all together for the rehearsal dinner. And Eric asked about my brother, Dan, who was also an electrical engineer and Penn State grad as he was. And if he had gotten out of the Air Force yet, I told him no, that, but it would be soon. Eric told me to have him get a hold of him if he was looking for a job. He would love to have my brother on board. He said, you don't often get an electrical engineer that has lab experience in the service. Well, when Dan got out of the service and he was looking for a job, three offers came up one of them being from Eric, which he took. Now, where is all this going? I made a decision to have Troy as my friend, which introduced me to his brother, Eric, who then I introduced to my brother, Dan. Eric then hired Dan. And Dan then moved from Florida to Dayton, later meeting and marrying his wife, Michelle, who was from Dayton. And together, they had my nephew, Connell. Wow. It's a long way to get where you're going. But you start to understand that each decision that we make in life is not always as trivial as you may think. And many decisions, if made differently, would alter the world. I mean, imagine if those hundred people hadn't come over and braved that three month or four month travel to the new world that were on the Mayflower. Life would be completely different as we know it by just that one act. We've been talking about decisions that mainly alter people being born, but what about other important matters like faith? Remember, we are all instrumental to the puzzle. In this puzzle of life, and ultimately of love, we influence everyone we meet in ways that we couldn't believe possible. This puzzle connects us, related or not, to each other in ways that affect our faith and our salvation. The minute that you decide to follow Christ and become a Christian, you have a valuable part to play in the work of God. You are now a very large instrument in placing puzzle pieces for God in a way that fits his box top. Remember that I told you that this puzzle is multi-layered as it covers more than earthly time. This is where Christians really come into play as we should have a puzzle piece that is very nearly shaped like Christ's own piece. 
you probably didn't realize that Jesus is a part of the puzzle too. But that's one of the most wondrous parts of this puzzle. That God has such an active role in it. I told you this puzzle is complex, yet connected in every way and in all ways through God. If I've learned anything in this life, it is that nothing is by chance. But all parts of this elaborate puzzle that we all fit into exactly. Even if you don't believe in God, you still fit into the puzzle and are important in some way. Look at Judas and how he fit into God's plan of salvation. Unfortunate that his choices took him down a very unhappy path, but his peace was still important. Only God knows the good pieces from the bad. But he also uses every piece according to its own design and continues to form the picture on the top of the box at each step along the way as time marches on. So how do you fit? I believe that as long as you breathe, you are still being picked up, rotated, and placed down in the puzzle again for a better fit. Will your peace resemble Christ? Will your peace be a cornerstone like Jesus that will allow many others to fit because of you? Will you have enough faith that God's knowledge of the top of the box is better than yours? The puzzle can be hard. Will you be patient enough to play the game out together? Or will you decide to go it alone? I can tell you this. There's a place where Christians get together and help each other. And where they learn to help the world with the puzzle. It's called church. It's the place where God shows you images of the box top to help you to bring others to the same place. Let us continue to pray that we have a clear image of the box top and a greater faith for the parts that we cannot see, knowing that how we live and what we do for others has the greatest impact on how God's puzzle goes together to finish the ultimate version of love. Thanks be to Almighty God. Amen. If you would please rise for hymn number 435.
Please be seated. Uh, before Ellen starts, I just wanted to tell you I got a note today that says uh, prayers for Reverend Ray Speakman. Uh, that's uh, Susan Speakman's husband. Uh, he is trying to determine if he has Lyme's disease or arthritis. So uh, he definitely, uh, we, he could use our prayers. So that's you. The deacon's prayer for the people. God, our Father, who creates all that is and all that will be, we thank you for always being with us and caring for our needs and well-being. You promise that where two or more gather in your name, you are with us and hear us. Now, Lord, hear our prayer for those close to us. We pray for Ray Speakman, Betty Ann Johnson, Bill Anderson, the Askins family, Connie Carey, Sarah Cornelius, Sarah Dorsey, Lois Garfield, John Skelton, Craig Kinney, Chris Murphy, the Drum family, Aggie Roach, Bob Lemer, Mary Thompson, Beverly Weber, the Wells family, John Banks, Scott Bain, Corey and Trish Atkinson, Andrew Fisher, Joe Manuela, Emily Hess, Joe Cassano, Joe and Patty Kuna, Jeff Tombaugh, Paula Tagg, Dottie Helgeson, Greg Cars, Al Alster, Sally Daglish, Sam and Roseanne Tremontana, Neil Dirchman, the Fouche family, all those affected by the war in Ukraine, Adam and AJ Bryan and Jake Ropaleski, and all other members of our armed forces. Almighty God, may we be to others what they need, a body to work when others cannot, a heart to love those who are forgotten, a shoulder to console those whose soul is in need, a smile to brighten the most somber of your children, and a mouth to proclaim your love. Strengthen and guide our congregation to know your will and be of service to our community. Help us to be a beacon of light, gathering and leading your people to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The opportunity to eat and drink with Christ is not a right bestowed upon the worthy, but a privilege given to the undeserving. All who come in faith, repentance, and love to the Lord's table are offered the bread and the cup, regardless of their age, their understanding, their denominational faith, or whether they have been baptized or not. Remember, those of you watching online are welcome to partake in communion with us. All you need is juice or wine, bread or crackers, and to follow along. If you would please rise for hymn number 460.
Please be seated. Brothers and sisters, this is the Lord's table. People will come from all over the earth and sit together in the kingdom of God. Our Savior invites those who trust in him to share in this feast, which he has prepared, the joyful feast of the people of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took the bread. And he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let's pray. Almighty Father, you spoke the world into being. Your word became flesh in Jesus Christ. By your spirit, you made us your people. When we were lost in sin, you found us, sending us your prophets and even your own son. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the choirs of angels and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Now, let us pray for God's rule on earth as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Holy Father, we give you thanks that on the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to you, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body, given to you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
the body of Christ given to you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you have filled us with your life. Christ our Savior, you have embraced us in your love. God our Father, you have fed us with your grace. Now, Send us out into your beloved world to share your life, your love, and your grace with all. Blessing and honor and glory to you, holy, holy, holy Lord. Amen. Today, I charge you to go out into the world knowing that you and everyone else is an integral part of God's plan for all of creation, and that if you so choose, you can be part of God's plan for bringing others to his great plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. Now receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace today, this week, and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.